celebrating 40 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, we'll have more from a recent land sustainability workshop. Meet one college student who's bringing what she's learning in the classroom to the field. As the debate over the health of meat products continues, bacon lovers say it's all hogwash. We'll examine if the salty snack is really as unhealthy as some would have you believe. Next, we'll have a different kind of feast. This one's for your eyes. We'll take you to a beautiful garden that's sure to inspire you as our temperatures continue warming up. And this logging business is a real family affair. Meet a pair of brothers that have built a reputation for cutting trees without cutting corners. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Troy Mulling. Thanks for joining us today here on Farm Week. We're starting off the show with part two of a story we first brought you last week. Yes, we certainly are. Last week we told you about the Sustainable Training and Agricultural Systems Program, better known by the acronym STARS. It teaches landowners how to practice land conservation and have a profitable business. You got that right. And today we'll revisit the recent STARS workshop and introduce you to a college student who looks forward to applying what she's learned in the future. Here's Farm with Amy Myers. A recent sustainability workshop brought participants to a successful timber operation, cattle farm, and a wildlife preserve where land conservation is diligently practiced. Attendees learned about everything from proper prescribed burning to the importance of keeping water sources clean and free of litter or chemicals both from the fertilizer and also just from the animal byproducts that are on the landscape, that ends up in the water and it creates algal blooms in the water. So if you've ever gone to a pond and it's got sort of a scuzzy green uh, layer on the top, often that's the result of too much of a good thing, too much fertilizer in that water. And wait, while it may not be necessarily a hazard for the fish, it certainly can impact your uh, quality of fishing. And if it continues, then it does begin to impact the, the quality of life for the fish. And what we found is uh, if you leave what's called a riparian corridor, basically trees along a stream or trees around a water body, that keeps that water temperature sure uh, cooler and that's better for the animals that are coming to use that whether it's your own cattle or the wildlife. Mississippi State University undergraduate student Willetta Madden says attending the STARS workshop yielded many benefits. I loved hearing about the northern bobwhite um, quail, their habitat and how specific of a habitat they have to have and learning about the warm season grasses I had heard about it in class but it was so wonderful to actually see where it had been incorporated into a farm and seeing how well it had benefited them. And I wish more people knew about the Farm Bill and CRP and EQIP and all the other incentives that are out there. To learn how you can benefit from Farm Bill conservation programs, visit nrcs.usda.gov. I'm Amy Myers reporting. Well, have you been waiting for spring to arrive? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman will show us a beautiful early spring landscape. The warmer weather of spring has arrived and our landscapes are waking up. Today I'm visiting with my friends Angie and Mark in their wonderful garden. As you enter their garden, Angie and Mark have trained the native Tangerine Beauty crossvine to scramble up and over this entrance arbor. It's simply covered in flowers. Tangerine Beauty crossvine is the well-behaved cousin to its rambunctious relative, Trumpet Creeper. The flower buds are a pinkish red and open into funnel-shaped orange, salmon, and yellow flowers. The flowers bloom on old wood, so prune immediately after flowering if needed. The main sitting area is enclosed by two curved raised planters constructed of hand-laid fieldstone. 
Here's the spring season combination of Telstar Red Picote Dianthus, Violet and Yellow Penny Marley's Viola, and the Purple Petunia. The stone planter is a nice background for the gorgeous upturned flowers of stargazer lilies. Across the back are Indian hawthorn shrubs and containers with blueberries in bloom. The gas fire pit warms the sitting area in the evening. To add interest, hanging baskets are strategically placed around the garden, such as this colorful red bougainvillea, which is waiting for the yellow ladybanks rose to catch up. There are also interesting garden art features. This rain chain adds interest as the rain barrel collects water. And the use of mirrors can alter the viewer's perception and deceive the eye. They can give the illusion of looking through to the garden on the other side. The weather is warm. Now get out there and enjoy your garden. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Dying Easter eggs with family and friends is a fun and unique tradition that's enjoyable for all ages. And in this week uh, episode of The Food Factor, Mississippi State Family and Consumer Scientist Specialist Natasha Haynes shows us how to dye eggs the all-natural way. I love a good Easter egg hunt, but do you know what I love even more? Decorating the eggs, especially when it's done all natural. Be creative this Easter, using items from your pantry or refrigerator to dye your boiled eggs. Use red cabbage to create vibrant blues, onion skins for red and orange coloring, and turmeric spices for beautiful yellows. Visit our Pinterest page for more specific recipes. To begin, place your chosen dye stuff in a saucepan of water and bring to a boil. Simmer for up to an hour until you're happy with the color. Cool and strain the liquid, then pour the concentrate into a syllable container or a mason jar. Remember to add a tablespoon of white vinegar to give a vibrant punch. Submerge the boiled eggs completely in the liquid. Seal the container and refrigerate overnight. The next morning, Air dry and rub with olive or vegetable oil to make those eggs shine. All natural dyes create an extraordinary Easter basket and a fun family project. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. For more all natural ways to dye your Easter eggs this year, be sure to visit the Mississippi State Extension Pinterest page. And now it's time for our uh, trivia quiz today and we're going to stick with the egg theme Today's question is, in 2016, Mississippi had over 1,400 poultry farms. According to the Mississippi Department of Agriculture and Commerce, what was the value of the eggs produced? Is the answer $83 million, $90 million, $97 million, or is it $104 million? Make your choice. We'll have the answer coming up. We're going to pause for a short break, but there's more to come here on Farm Week. Meat, it's sweet, it's salty, and it's delicious. But studies say too much of certain types can be bad for your health. We'll cut through the fat and get to the bottom of it. And Jason and Jeremy Flora are brothers in life and brothers in logging. Coming up, hear how they got started and how their way of doing business has resulted in a winning reputation and local fame. Stay with us. utilize private well water as the source of your household drinking water, then you need to get it screened for bacterial contamination at least once a year. Today we're going to show you how to take a water sample for this screening. First, water sample bottles are available from your local Mississippi State University Extension Office. They are sterile, sealed, and contain a small amount of sodium thiosulfate to dechlorinate the sample for a more accurate screening result. Choose the faucet that is closest to the wellhead. If a water hose is attached, remove it before taking the sample and try to avoid any dirty areas. Using a disinfecting wipe or an alcohol type towelette or a paper towel wetted with a light bleach solution, kill any bacteria that may be present on the faucet. 
Allow the solution to dry before collecting the sample. Turn on the water full force and let it run for at least two minutes. After that time has passed, reduce the water flow to a small stream. Grab your bottle and unwrap the protective seal. Do not touch the inside of the bottle. Fill the water sample just above the 100 milliliter line, making sure you do not overflow the bottle, which might rinse out the powder in the bottle. Screw the cap back on the bottle and get it to the Mississippi Well Owner Network workshop or the lab as soon as possible, and definitely within 24 hours of collecting the sample. It seems as if we can't go more than a few days without seeing a report linking what we eat to our long-term health. Meat lovers, and specifically fans of bacon, get their fair share of those types of stories. Risk of high blood pressure, cancer and heart disease, or just a handful of what could happen if a bad diet becomes a habit. So the question remains, with all the news out there, has it caused folks to take pause as they approach the table? In 2015, carnivores worldwide were stunned by news from the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer that their diets might be dishing them up disease. Pouring over 800 studies, the WHO labeled red meat a probable carcinogen, suggesting a possible connection to colorectal, pancreatic, and prostate cancers. But some health officials say consumers have taken the warning with a grain of salt. I think we think about these guidelines as evolving. Um, it's been a pretty consistent message by many leading organizations, both related to cancer as well as cardiovascular disease, that red meat may increase risk. Dietitian Dr. Kathy Mellon says the conclusions of the 22 health experts from 10 countries tax onto decades of medical knowledge about diet and disease prevention, but fail to pin the tail on lamb, pork, or beef. However, the IARC did issue its most dire classification for other American food staples, and hot dogs, cold cuts, and bacon also struck out with other global health authorities. There is enough evidence there for many organizations to say we should significantly limit the processed meats in our diet. Last year, the American Institute for Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund reiterated WHO findings that for every 1.8 ounces or 50 grams of processed meat eaten per day, the risk of lower stomach cancers increases by 18 percent. Experts say the WHO's food findings only up the average lifetime risk of developing colon carcinoma via consumption of salted, cured, fermented, and smoked meats from 5 to 6 percent a lower danger level when compared to cigarettes and asbestos, which share the category of known carcinogens. Still, many believe the notion of killer meat can hoof it. No bacon! <laughs> Others choose to celebrate all things bacon. You don't have to look far to find a bacon fest or a bacon proponent eager to point out the benefits. Sometimes bacon gets a bad rap. With a balanced diet, you know, you can incorporate bacon into your diet and make it a healthy, you know, it's, you know, it's good fat, good in protein. I think it's the perfect food. It's salty, it's sweet. I don't eat bacon every day. I love it, but I don't. You know, they're kind of using scare tactics. You know, hot dogs are bad for you, meat's bad for you. You know, again, everything in moderation. According to the USDA, there are 67.6 million head of hogs across the U.S., all those cuts are both freshly cooked and cured to extend shelf life. And common preservatives like sodium nitrate and nitrite have become a major target of cancer warnings. But some niche producers assert that an uncured approach utilizing natural safeguards like celery brine may be safer and taste better. As minimally processed as possible is what we're about. Berkwood Farms, a co-op of about 40 family operations, supplies the Berkshire breed to many bacon festivals and beyond. All of our products are a nitrite-free product, so I don't really consider ours as processed meat um, like all the other larger corporations. Pork producer Randy Hilleman says Berkwood Farms' production techniques have earned a reputation among discerning consumers who yearn for the good old days. 
that kind of started uh, 20, 30 years ago or 40 years ago when they, they started buying pork by lean premium. And so they got the pigs leaner and leaner and leaner. Well, the flavor is in the fat. And if you don't have any fat, you don't have the flavor. I don't know how many people have said that is the best ham they've ever had in their life, even 80-year-olds. Berkwood Farms hopes the appetite for nostalgia will help grow their business. And as medical authorities seek to first do no harm, debate over meat products will continue to be processed by all stakeholders. Well, what goes great with bacon? Well, eggs, of course. And that was the subject of our trivia quiz today. We wanted to know what was the 2016 value of eggs produced in Mississippi poultry farms? Well, if you said D, it was an excellent choice. The answer is $104 million. A boy's first hero is his father. It's a title that isn't so much earned as it is thrust upon him. Jason and Jeremy Flora have followed in their father's footsteps as loggers from an early age. After learning the trade from their dad, the brothers later ventured out on their own to establish a company for themselves. Since then, Flora Logging out of Mabin, Mississippi has expanded from a small-time operation to one of the premier logging businesses in the state. During that time, the brothers have pushed each other to get better, taken calculated risks, and followed the golden rule with their customers. Together since 1999, and we started when we were six years old, working in the woods. With a beginning like that, one might say Jason and Jeremy Flora's career was planned out by the time they hit elementary school. They cut their teeth by cutting wood for their father, a logger himself. Their childhood was spent honing their skills, even skipping school, to pitch in when one of their dad's workers didn't show. We enjoyed it. We grew up doing it, and, you know, we was making a pretty good living doing it. We was in the teenage years, we, uh, we would, uh, you know, we'd go hollow some putt wood and make money and all the kids thought, you know, we was rich because we'd go haul a couple loads of putt wood, we'd have $75 in our pocket and back then, you know, that was a lot of money. When they decided to make a go of it on their own, their dad gave them some old equipment to help them get the business off the ground. He kind of gave us that old skitter and old loader when we started and we cut with a chainsaw and then 1999 we bought a, I think it was an 88 model tree cutter. And that was the first tree cutter that we had. And that's what we learned to thin with and everything. Soon after, their big break came. Our first good job together. It was a, it was actually a track that a lot of people were trying to buy. It was a 55 acre track at, at an, in a little community called Clarkston. And uh, it had a lot of light poles on it. We cut it together and you know, done good on it. And that's, I, that's where the track I think that really got us going is that track right there. Little by little, their reputation grew. Business is good with as many as three supervised crews working different jobs. The Floras own six logging trucks and have contracts on seven more. They even bought their first new knuckle boom loader in 2005. The brothers specialize in thinning pine plantations. Jeremy negotiates with landowners and Jason takes the lead on the equipment side. We work together in the woods, you know, if, if somebody misses, I'll fill in or, or he'll fill in. So, you know, it, it, it works good together having a partner because if I need to take off and go fishing, I can, I, I've got the uh, ability that I can take off and go fishing. And if he needs to go to ball tournaments with his little girls, uh, he can take off and go and we've got somebody there to run the show, you know. It takes both of us to run the size operation that we're running, you know. I'd hate to know I come out here and had to run it by myself. This well-oiled logging machine caused the Mississippi Forestry Association to take notice in the form of a nomination for Outstanding Logger of the Year. What was a nomination has now turned into a win. Actually, the nomination came forth from one of our uh, association board members who had personally had uh, Flora to log their timber and were just uh, completely satisfied with the job that they did. That award is selected by our Timber Harvesting Committee, and the Timber Harvesting Committee is made up of members from across the state, 
folks that work for various uh, forestry industry companies and, and other groups uh, across the state. They're looking for a logger that has a, a good business sense and good business abilities. Uh, safety record is really important for that committee when they select the outstanding logger of the year. In fact, since forming the company almost 20 years ago, there hasn't been a single workday loss accident. As impressive as that is, in order to take the crown for outstanding logger of the year, the winner must also possess professionalism when it comes to dealing with people and the environment. What sets the Flora Brothers apart is their honesty. Even if it's an 80 year old lady or a 50 year old guy who has the knowledge on forestry and know what to expect, the payment is the same. So they handle everything and they'll give them the paycheck by the end of the day. That's kind of the thing, theme that you hear over and over is they treat people like like you would want to be treated. They're very friendly, they're a part of their community, they support their local uh, organizations, the civic organizations, the schools, uh, the local businesses. Uh, they're just a, a very integral part of their communities. Everybody knows them, everybody likes them, and uh, you just couldn't ask for better neighbors. Uh, that you'd like them as neighbors as well as loggers. The interactions they have with the landowners is just fantastic. They're, they're willing to look out for the landowners and they have a good relationship with everyone they work with. Uh, which is a huge benefit for them and a huge benefit for the landowners they work with. To be the winner is just a, a huge uh, plus for the company, for, the, for them personally as well. It shows just you know, how, what they do for the industry and how well they take care of themselves and their workers and the landowners and the, just the natural resource that we have out here. Um, you, know, you can look around here and if you don't, you don't see any trees scratched up from the equipment, they, they take care of it. Through it all, they've managed to make sure family stays at the forefront of the family business, even if a friendly sibling rivalry sometimes gets in the way. It's still like that today. And if he talks about something he can do out here better than anybody running a knuckle boom or a tree cutter, you know, we all laugh about it and just go on. And I tell him I'm better at it, but I don't tell him. <laughs> well, we always pushed each other because, uh, you know, this and I always wanted to be the top one, you know. Uh, we got old enough to start running chainsaws, you know, we, we'd fight to whoever could cut the wood up with the chainsaw. It's always a, a push for each other. He, he, uh, he, he comes at me and uh, says, oh, you ain't doing nothing. I said, yeah, I'm doing more than you think I did. You ain't answered my phone 50 times today. Other members of the family are involved in flora logging too. Their wives, Kimberly and Ashley, work together to make sure day-to-day -day operations run smoothly behind the scenes. They're really smart and they keep the business side of this thing going. Um, my wife does all the stumpage work and uh, pays, pays the stumpage out. And it's a, when you go through 120, 130 loads a week and you hauling on three different landowners and you got 20 trucks hauling some weeks, and you know it's, it's a lot of paperwork goes into it and then Jason's wife pays the bills on the on the bill side of it and as much as equipment trucks and and employees and stuff as we got that's a you know that's a lot of work going out in a week too. There's even been talk of bringing in Jeremy's oldest son to help run the business one day. In the meantime the Flora Brothers will have no shortage of customers. If you want them to cut your trees today you better hurry up today and, and, and book them because the wait time is two years. For them to get this award, it will help them market themselves even better. I guess now the waiting time will be three years. And Leighton, a little bit more about the brothers. Jason says the best piece of advice he's ever received in his career is to save your money, don't spend too much, and make sure your crews are paid on time and he says his favorite piece of machinery to operate is the knuckle boom loader. And Troy Jeremy says the best piece of advice that he ever received is work hard and don't be scared to take chances. And he tells us the tree cutter is his favorite piece of equipment to operate. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with those guys and we're going to take you up on that lunch one of these days. In the meantime, we've got a, another great show going on uh, for next week. Leighton, what do we have? Well, you won't be the only person, the only ham in the studio nope. next week. Canned ham, country ham, 
every ham in between. We'll go over all the different varieties for all of your meal options. And check this out. People don't usually associate bamboo with Mississippi, but that could be changing. We'll tell you why it's being planted and what the landowners are hoping to achieve with the bamboo. And hey, we've got mail. Ask the gardening guru himself, Gary Bachman, will be tackling all of your gardening questions. And we want to mention this before we leave you today. Leighton and I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Peter Allen's class. We've got some video of it. These are grad students from Mississippi State University's Wildlife, Fisheries, and Aquaculture Department. Now, Leighton, you've done this a couple times before, but it was my first year speaking with the class. I always look forward to this. We spoke with these students about the news and broadcasting industry. We gave them some advice on what to expect if they're ever interviewed for radio or television. Afterwards, this was the fun part. We put the camera on them and did a couple rounds of mock interviews. When that was over, we played the interviews back even gave them a little bit of advice on how they did. And speaking for Troy and myself, we both enjoyed it a whole lot. I hope everyone there learned a lot from us, and we certainly thank them for the invitation. And we thank you so much for joining us this week as well. I'm Troy Mullen. And I'm Leighton Spann. We'll see you next time.